the ties are unique. There are not many places you go in the world where you feel welcomed, where you feel as a foreigner safe, where you feel as a foreigner part of respected and kind of welcome to come and visit their country. When I met him, I was really surprised because he's what you would think of as being a famous writer. You know, he's handsome, he's charming, all that stuff. And uh, and most of them aren't. You know, I meet a lot because of my job, and uh, they don't fit that at all. But that's why I was so shocked when he did. Uh, the groups of people was, uh, who have decided to live in Bangkok, to settle in Bangkok. And that's very strange because they don't come here for working or for... They just pass through Bangkok and sometimes they say, oh, this country has a lot of uh, possibilities. We have also a kind of uh, Dolce Vita, I think. That's, uh, that's right, they have the Dolce Vita. He took one of the most fascinating places in the world and put a really good story behind it. So, you know, you get hit at two levels. The story's good, the story's interesting, but also, I mean, reading about these places if you've never been here is, it's amazing. The Bangkok Dwar movement really started with Christopher Moore, who very early on, uh, started writing novels set in the Bangkok night and using the uh, fabulous range of characters and situations and places that exist in what we call the Bangkok night, which is basically the night entertainment business which spreads across the city of Bangkok and involves thousands and thousands of bars, music places, and hundreds of thousands of people really from all over the world. And I used to make movies and then when I stopped making movies, I, I had always uh, drawn and painted and, and was taking it more seriously. And I would visit uh, Christopher Moore uh, when I was in Bangkok, having read all his books. And one night we were sitting uh, on Soy Cowboy, uh, and I asked Christopher, has anyone ever painted all of the stuff that's in your books? And we kind of thought about the German Expressionists who painted Berlin in the 1920s, and the, the Paris Fauvists who painted Paris nightlife in the 1900s. And we really couldn't think of a single artist, uh, Thai or foreigner, who was using the Bangkok night and the Bangkok noir setting that's found in Christopher Moore's books as a subject and background for paintings. And Christopher said to me, kind of joking, because up until then I'd mainly painted uh, drawn portraits, he said, why don't you do it? And so it was really the idea that I would start painting the Bangkok noir setting came at a meeting with Christopher Moore while we were sitting drinking a beer in Soy Cowboy. Everybody was talking about him, everybody was thinking, you know, what's he going to do in the next one and, and that kind of thing. So he caught on as a writer right away here, but again, over the years, he's he's really gone on to not just be a local writer at all, he's just uh, a writer who happens to be based here. There must be a 500, 100, several hundred famous detectives in literature? To invent a new one is pretty hard. But well, one of the interesting things about Christopher Moore's books, and I've read all of them, especially the Calvino books, is that the first books were really about an early version of the Bangkok night. And that was a version that, that really centered around the Thermai coffee shop in, in its original version. Uh, which was kind of an all-night place full of these old Bangkok characters, many of whom were veterans from the Vietnam War. Again, when I first started, it was just a bunch of sleazy expats, mostly. But, you know, that's just, the books were here. They were about sleazy places. and uh, But, you know, again, over the years, it's not that way at all. Everybody's reading them. Met at one of the drinking halls in Sukhumvit. Every evening we would get together chat about this and that. I had in mind the project to translate one of the books of uh, Christopher um, because in his book he explained a lot of uh, daily life, street life, soy life in Bangkok. To go from a lawyer to a writer is a pretty big jump. Bar girls, alcoholic expats, chaos, crime, Chris Moore. I, I met Christopher Moore in the Thermo bar 
downstairs off Sukhumvit Road. It's an amazing bar and you, you should probably go there. We ended up talking about a case that I was preparing for and we talked through it and I, I thought to myself, Chris was a, I'd been told, was a corporate lawyer when he was practicing law and I thought, well, he won't, probably won't know anything about, you know, the, the sort of, the ins and outs of doing a trial. But he was remarkably perceptive about what the issues were in this trial that was coming up. And I ended up jotting down four or five pages of notes um, in this bar uh, at 1.30 in the morning. Um, filled with um, gorgeous girls and wrecks of men um, and incorporated most of it into my closing address uh, thankfully for the client who was acquitted between 19 early 90s when Christopher first got here uh, and Bangkok today in 2010 there's been a tremendous change in Bangkok crowd that lives here now is quite different than the crowd that lived here in the early 90s. There, all of that change has been reflected in Christopher Moore's books, especially the Calvino series. Calvino, who used to be a kind of down and out detective who barely got by, in the latest book is now living in a penthouse condo. And a lot of that's reflection of not only Thailand's change, but also modern Asia. Modern Asia has gone from being a, a backwater of third world impoverished countries to a part of the world where you have a very high level of prosperity, a very high level of education, a high level of style, a high level of development. The pace of change is just so rapid in Asia. He uses uh, a lot of Thai words, Thai expressions, as well now he likes so much the proverbs. One thing very important uh, to consider if we translate the book of Christopher is uh, not to, to, to spoil the spirit. It seems to me that great books um, usually can go beyond the translator, but uh, it still it makes sense logically that they could, they could screw it up too. But Vincent Calvino also goes to places like Saigon, Phnom Penh, and Pattaya, and it's always the same mixture of bizarreness and violence that intrigues you from page one till the very end. It doesn't matter whether they're set in Bangkok or Phnom Penh or Saigon, um, which gives them a, a lovely sort of Asian, tropical, humid, steamy feel to them. Uh, the moral story underneath it is timeless. The book which he modelled on me I find quite hilarious, of course. You know, seeing some slight parts of my character that he has uh, exaggerated, such as my tendency towards being a disciplinarian. Uh, Calvino has a sidekick in many of his novels uh, who was maybe more or less fashioned upon me. It was a Frankenstein type metamorphosis of myself. Christopher ran and hid hid from me for about three or four months after that. <laughs> uh, Calvino and McPhail love each other. You can see that. And they're very, very different uh, sorts of people who have come to respect and uh, I think, you know, love each other very much. And it's kind of the same in some ways with Christopher, the real man, and myself. More recently in his book, Calvino has more and more his uh, aggressive Western style. And uh, I don't know Christopher as somebody aggressive or he must control himself very well. <laughs> and I think somewhere along the line, of course, Chris would like to be Calvino. Calvino is a, is a rough and tumble uh, kind of guy that gets torn up and bloodied and has to kill people uh, and deals more or less with the underbelly of Bangkok. He ends up having to kill people and he does do it rather effectively even with his little 38 revolver. This is a way I think vicariously to uh, 
you know, uh, live through his characters. I think the Calvino character is, is not really Christopher Moore himself. The Calvino character is a construct that Christopher Moore has created. I think uh, Christopher uses Calvino for showing how a Falun behave in Bangkok. Chris has sort of invented another kind of... I, and I wouldn't even say he's anti-hero. Chris's character is someone who is constantly trying to redeem himself, I guess. I don't know. He has this ability to understand the key point of a situation, of a, of a factual situation. And I think, he, I think Calvino does as well. Calvino sort of manages to identify um, the, the, the trees from the forest um, and can sort of find his way through the bullshit. Before Christopher did the novel uh, Waiting for the Lady, I was going up to Burma. I, I had this wacky idea to go up and take a look at some Ming Dynasty porcelain. So we went up on a mission. We went up, at, it seems, at the same time when the lady was to be released. And it was the last time that she was released. And the whole world media was there. CNN, BBC, you know, everybody was there, you know, waiting for her to come out from house detention. And my main man up there, my Burmese fellow, who's my brother, and Christopher and I were sitting there having a beer about 10 o'clock in the morning. And all of a sudden, this convoy comes rolling down the street. And, uh, you know, Teto said, oh, you know, that's Aung San Suu Kyi. And I said, well, where, where would she go? Would she go to the Shui de Gon? Would they, you know, would she have a rally there? He said, no, 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 she'll go to the NLD headquarters. So I said, cool, let's go. So we blew down there. So he sets one of his stories in Burma, and it's called Waiting for the Lady, and, it, and there's, a, there's a lovely, in, there's, a, there's a little section in it where Calvino literally bumps into Aung San Suu Kyi, and, and, and it's a fleeting, a fleeting sort of encounter, and it doesn't lead to anything, but it, it, it just, just having her introduced into the narrative um, and having a brief few paragraphs about her plight and how difficult it is for her in terms of what she's trying to achieve. Got out of the car and Christopher, because he's taller, you know, I put him as the axe in front of the, <laughs> the door and they ushered us inside and put us right in the very, very front and we were sitting about three feet away from Aung San Suu Kyi. She, she had been interviewed by Christopher previously. I think, uh, to me, the most interesting aspect of Christopher Moore's books is not really the plot, and it's not really the uh, background, so-called sexual or sleaze content. What's really interesting and unique about his books are that he, Christopher has lived here so long and knows so much about Thailand, Thai people, Farangs in Thailand, that he provides tremendous insights into the interior thinking of his characters. And when you have a Thai character, Christopher often will go inside his mind and take the Farang reader, the non-Thai or non-Thai resident reader, into the Thai person's mind and look outside through that person's eyes at the world of Bangkok and the world of Thailand through their perception. And that perception is often completely unique and different than a Western perception might be. Christopher, uh, he shows how uh, Thai people look at the world in a very strange way sometimes, and that their culture is so old and has so many elements in it of Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, animism, pre-animism, as well as Westernism, that the complexity of their view of the world is often uh, not only kind of astonishing and surprising to the Western reader of Christopher's books, but a kind of an illuminating moment where you say, oh my God, these people really think in a way that I'm completely unfamiliar with. Yeah, in some ways, it's a little bit like the, the night of the living dead at times. You look out the street and you see people, their arms are a little too loose by their sides. They're walking along, and their eyes aren't quite focused. And it's only 7 o'clock at night. Yeah. <laughs>
there's not a genuine explanation as to why that happened. But it's something between about 6.30 and 8.30 is kind of a zombie moment when people are the most vulnerable. Being observant, he, he walks around with his eyes open and he always carries with him his little lap sash with a little notebook in it and if something strikes him he'll make a note of it. Whether that note ever gets into a novel or not, who knows, but I'm sure that some of them do. So that's... No, I mean I've seen him wandering around with his little notebook taking notes, going down to a fishing village and the south of Patia and I've accompanied him once or twice take on his research errands. In Bangkok you can find grasshoppers, scorpion, water bugs, worms and spiders. A nightly buffet of bugs is sold. The thing with the bug stand is they have an unlimited supply. We don't know exactly where their source is, but we know there's a death of thousands and thousands of grasshoppers, cockroaches, water bugs, and frogs. The disparate forces that are at play, the, the, the disparate sort of superstructure forces, to use a Marxist term, which is completely inappropriate in a place like Thailand. You know, at the Texan, I don't know if Christopher's ever told you, but at the Texan, in the very top, if you go up there, you can still see today, that was a uh, CIA listening post, and uh, you can still see the wires and all coming out of the walls. And the Iranian embassy used to be uh, just next door. You can pick up every word from this point. This is actually a directional mic. I think whoever is behind the massacre of those bugs is plugged into this system. <laughs> probably where it happens. This is more than a conspiracy. Indeed, this is Christopher G. Moore on top of a building in Sawing Cowboy, where it really does happen. Follow me. He's also pretty well connected with some of the senior players here. Um, I, I think he knows at least one ex-Prime Minister, and it, it's not Taxon, by the way, um, and you know, it knows him well enough to socialise with him or be able to ring him up and, or for him, for the Prime Minister, the ex-Prime Minister to ring him up and ask Chris's views about things. Well, I, I, I don't know, I mean, maybe there is, you know, he's quite a mysterious person sometimes. He, if, you know, if he has some secret contact, he won't tell me about it. Moore makes it very clear that the the lot of a private detective here in within Thai society is not at all a glamorous one. Motive we understand, it's greed, it's profit. Consumers are everywhere. Just as the zombie hour is about to end, the bug eating frenzy is starting. He knows how to weave a story. I know mosquitoes. It's Apparently rats have an allergy to K-pop. I didn't know that. Yeah. You know, the insecticide search last night, we should have been here. He's told me that the next novel that he's working on is um, he's bringing Calvino back to New York for the first time in 20 years.
Calvino goes back to New York where he was kind of um, expunged as a lawyer for doing something which at this point we don't know about. He's bringing him back to trace and regain his own roots in New York. That's where the next novel begins. So I think Calvino is going, you know, as we all do as we get older, backwards, to find out what events in our life formed us. And Calvino seems to be able to tell us the rights and the wrongs of the situation, the rapaciousness of some of the protagonists, the selflessness of others, um, and it's not his novels don't appear to me to be formulaic. I mean, there's not... Yeah, they... The stories are all different. Culture and language are the same thing, especially in Thailand. Uh, so, uh, there is uh, not just a, a, a desire, but there's a need to include it in a, the book on Thailand, if it ever gets written. And... Uh, Chris gets closer as he goes. It's very difficult to discern the order in Thailand without having a kind of detective point of view, i.e. the Thai culture never reveals itself completely and directly, and most Thai people uh, never reveal themselves completely and directly. In order to understand anything in Thailand and anything about Thai people, you have to kind of function almost like a detective. You have to look for little clues and ask little questions and collect little answers and gradually piece together what the underlying meaning and overall meaning of what Thailand is, what Bangkok is, and what the Thai people are. Hold on a second. Can I have a hash? Yeah, I'm Richard Kirk Duran, and uh, I'm an artist, I'm a gemologist. Gemology is what brought me to Asia in the very beginning. Uh, the best rubies, sapphires, and jade in the world come out of Burma, so this is where I needed to be to buy the finest stones in the world. And uh, going up there and being introduced to the tribes people, I was given some books by a bishop, one of the bishops up there that I used to play badminton with, and it was Sir George Scott's accounts of uh, uh, the Upper Shan States, the Burma Gazetteer from 1900, and I got fascinated with the subject and decided to chronicle all the tribes of Burma. I had a book published called The Vanishing Tribes of Burma, uh, published by Weidenfeld Nicholson. It was launched at the United Nations in London for the decade of the world's indigenous people and uh, turned out to be the most comprehensive ethnographic study of the tribes since Scott. So I'm very happy with that. Um, Nobel Peace Prize winner Aung San Suu Kyi wrote me a beautiful letter praising the book, you know. I got her a copy, I had it smuggled into her through an embassy which we shall remain unnamed. <laughs> Gentleman goat farmer. Well, first of all, one needs a sufficient sum of money to be able to retire from the business world, which I was fortunate enough to acquire at the age of 35 by selling my business. I was the first person to collect chi laws from China and translate them into English and make commentary on them. And since then, for the last 14, nearly 15 years, I've been retired in Thailand. I am Bruno Le Mercier. I'm born in France, exactly in Normandy. And uh, I travel in Asia since uh, 1972, which is a long time now. And I almost settled in Thailand for now 12 years. So I've met Christopher about 10 years ago when he released his book, uh, Minor Wives. My name's George Goldberg and I run Gecko Books in Chiang Mai. Thailand. Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, when you live in Thailand so long, you forget that nobody knows where Chiang Mai really is. My name is Aaron Frankel. 
I'm the director of Groovy Map, which is a map designed to help people locate where the hell they are and what's fun around them. It's aimed at business travelers and what we call short stay travelers. Three days, thank you very much, in and out, goodbye. And I went to America for the first time to live when I was 18 for college. So you could say most of my life was spent in Thailand. I speak Thai, know the language, know the people pretty much, although I remain a foreigner and will always be referred to as Oho Falang Yu, Mani Noi. Being at the bar for the last nine years now, eight years, um, I fell into doing criminal work. Just getting a number of criminal jobs and getting more of them. So that's how that worked. So and, and that's my, my background. I was born and bred in Perth and I went to university in the eastern states in Canberra and then I came back to Perth. Some people have called me the Toulouse La Trek of Bangkok. And the Baccarabar, where we're standing, is the Moulin Rouge of Bangkok. But actually, I think Bangkok is so unique that I'm just the Chris Coles of Bangkok, and this is my studio.